Well, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, session on the global downturn in the developing world. Um, I'm Gideon Rachman, I write for the Financial Times and um, I'm moderating the session. Like, like many people here, uh, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in, back in January and I well remember that everybody was in a bit of a panic, but there was a particular concern about how the financial crisis and the economic crisis that followed it were going to affect the developing world. I remember talking to ministers from South Africa, from Egypt, saying that they were worried that foreign investment was going to uh, be cut off, that trade flows were going to be cut off, that there was going to be a surge in protectionism. And indeed, the World Bank had a great concern at the time, which they expressed, that, that, that the economic downturn would be very severe in the developing world and would see the cost not just in slower growth, but actually in people losing their lives. You'd, you'd have real hunger. Nine months on, we're, we're meeting in Dalian. The world economy looks a little better than it did uh, back in Davos. But I'm particularly intrigued to know how things look in, in the developing world. And one of the joys of the Economic Forum is its ability to bring together people and perspectives from all over the world. And this session is a particularly good example. We're privileged to, to have with us today uh, people from uh, all over the world, as I say. We have, uh, almost at the end, uh, Mr. Lim Guang Eng, the Chief Minister of Penang in Malaysia. Just uh, two down from me, we have Mohammed Safwat Mahaldin, the Minister of Investment for Egypt. R right at the end, Shah Zhu Kang, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations. In the middle, Hannah Tetter, the Minister for Trade and Industry of Ghana. Towards, the, just, on, just next to her, we have Luis Villegas, the President of the National Business Association of Colombia, so we have a Latin American voice. And finally, just next to me, we have Mr. Zhang Zhaokuang, the Vice Chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission of the People's Republic of China, our hosts. But before I turn to our panelists, uh, you in the audience have a little bit of work to do. You may have noticed you got given some devices, uh, voting devices, as you came in. And uh, the forum would like to hear your opinion on a question. Can, can we have the slides, please, so I can talk you through it? OK. The first thing you're meant to do is press the little red button. Press the on-off button to turn on your voting device. And then uh, when you get uh, asked a question, you press the number corresponding to your vote. And then you press <coughs> confirm. But I haven't asked you the question yet. Just remember, press the number corresponding to your vote. Then press confirm. Press cancel if you want to change your choice. It's a bit like a, you know, one of those uh, automatic distributors of cash. Uh, the practice vote, we're going to have a practice first, is simply to find out where everybody in the audience is from. So could I ask you, which continent are you from? And presumably, we'll get some numbers. There you go, one, Africa, two, Asia. So press the uh, number of the continent you're from and confirm, and then we should get a result within about 30 seconds or so. My guess is that uh, we will find that we have most people from Asia, would be. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's see. OK. We up here do not get to vote, so uh, we're, not, we're not going to see. And I'm told that it takes roughly 30 seconds for this, uh, these devices to, uh, there's some sort of electronic chirruping going on there. I don't know whether that means all the vote, votes are being processed. Um, ah, there we go, okay. Yeah, well, as I said, that was a bit of a no-brainer. We have most people here from Asia, 64, 9, et cetera, et cetera. So that proves that the voting uh, machine, as well as giving us a fascinating piece of information, obviously, uh, gives us uh, the crucial evidence that the voting devices work. So now we're going to ask you the next question. And the question we want to get your opinion on is which market will contribute the most to growth in the developing world in the next decade? And again, you've got a choice. Greater China, North America, Europe, Middle East, Asia. Now, uh, well, I mean, I, I think uh, it's fairly obvious what people are going to vote for, but we'll see. Uh, maybe it'll be, uh, could be Asia excluding China, possibly. But, uh, and I think the red line is telling us that your votes are being processed. And when it gets to the top, I'm getting the hang of it now, uh, we'll find out the answer. Um, Uh, 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, Greater China, 67 percent, 19, 67 votes. Those aren't percents, they're votes. <laughs> 19 for Asia, 5 for North America, 2 for Europe. Well, thank you as the European here. Um, <laughs> Um, one, one for Latin America, one for Africa. So, well, I think that's pretty unequivocal, but um, we actually have uh, several ministers up here who have to think about these things as ministers for trade and investment. So perhaps uh, Minister Mahaldeen from, from Egypt, looking at those results, thinking about where the investment is going to come for Egypt, does that, is that more or less how you see it? Is, are you very Asia-focused, very China-focused at the moment? Um, very much so. During the last uh, five years in particular, we have been uh, seeing very significant inflows of capital and more trade with the, um, the new Eastern Hemisphere uh, from, uh, from China, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, and India. But still, I wouldn't really say that um, the, uh, the Asian economies are contributing to most of our capital flows, no more than 20 to 25 percent. And in terms of trade, it's no more than 30 uh, percent. And the rest is still with the, Uni uh, the United States and Europe. And this is a very big difference from the case, say, 10 years ago, where 90 percent of our trade was with the EU and uh, the United States. Well, b beyond this interesting um, statistics, and of course, one has to be putting into consideration some sort of bias of, of the sample um, and, and put it into perspective. I think China is going to be doing better and more uh, for the world in the future. But we, re we don't really need to exaggerate that yet because the weight of the Chinese economy and the consumption of China, say, is not really more in reality than that of France. And the GDP um, of China is still around 6 to 7 percent of that of the world. Things are changing very fast, mm -hmm. and it is very much predi predicted by almost everybody, including some European think tanks, that within 20 years, China is going to be number one, India number two, the United States and Japan number three or four, and then no European country is going to be making it to the top five, but possibly the whole EU is going to be as number five. This is a very much a changing world, and I think the crisis that we are talking about is expedite, expediting this process even further. But if, if you allow me, on the impact of the crisis, which Please, is yeah. on developing countries, and you just mentioned the issues of trade and investment, Egypt and neighboring countries in Africa and the Middle East had had their fair share of the crisis. Um, FDI has dropped by something like 35% from the peak and 25% from the averages of the last three years. There had been a drop of trade, and despite the, um, um, the effort of diversifying trade and investment, this was very much the case. But unlike what you talked about when you had your interviews back in January, I think the concern today is more with some of the suggested cures and packages of solutions rather than the crisis itself. Mm. Stimulus packages mean more budget deficits. Yeah. Easing of monetary policies could mean inflation to be expected. We have been seeing not just signs of new protectionist measures, but traditional old-fashioned interventionist measures facing trade with the failure of the Doha round confronting us, in addition to the resistance to capital flows as well, that started actually even before the abruption of the crisis last year with this saga of the sovereign wealth funds almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have the problem really with some of the cure that we need to really face today, that when, when you say that the G20, for instance, is doing something and there is some good collaboration at the international level, at the same time, I think the coordination should be in the phasing out of some of the measures that had been introduced, not to disturb the developing countries even further. Okay. Hannah Tetter, uh, how, how do things look in Ghana? And, and specifically on these two questions, firstly, do you feel you're beyond the worst of the crisis or do you still feel you're in the midst of an economic crisis? And secondly, 
going back to where we started, I mean, th there is this huge interest in, in Asian investment. Is that something that you share? And you mentioned when we were talking before the session that you see a different style in the way that, say, the Chinese treat uh, Ghana and the way that uh, the Europeans and the Americans do. And I think people would be interested to hear about that. Well, let me start with your second question first. Do we see a difference in the way we do business with Asia as compared to the way we do business with the Western world? Most definitely. Because the tendency has been, and perhaps that's a relic of colonialism, that uh, the economic prescriptions given to us are exactly that, very prescriptive, very patronizing, and they come with conditions precedent. We're talking about peace and security, we're talking about good governance, and then economic development is part of that process. But we cannot constantly be on the receiving end of aid and handouts. And for countries like mine that have done a lot to be able to stabilize themselves democratically, we can say that we've had now about five consecutive elections. We have changed governments twice through those elections. We don't need that lecture anymore. When we're doing business with the Asians, especially with the Chinese, we focus on the core issues that are of consequence to our economy. How do we deal with where we think we have shared interests? How can we best attract investments from China and from other countries in Asia that will be to our mutual benefit? And at the end of the day, how quickly can we get this done? Looking at it from the um, perspective of the Western world, invariably, what happens is that you might get something that won't even build a factory as a direct commitment from a government. But, so just to pick you up on that, so, I mean, obviously you, you slightly prefer the style with which the Chinese treat you, but just in terms of where the money is coming from, are they, uh, the Chinese and other Asian investors now, as significant or more significant as the Europeans and Americans, or is that a trend for the future? I think that over the last, especially in Ghana, over the last five years, they've had a lot more significance. And I think that is definitely going to be the trend of the future for the reasons that I already mentioned. I think that um, over the next 10 years, and I quite agree with my colleague from Egypt, you will see that the focus will shift and the major trading partners between Africa and um, the rest of the world will change as well. Now, whether that would be necessarily only dealing with the Far East is something that we do not think would be in our interest. Right. Our greatest weakness as a continent is that we don't do enough business with each other. And our own integration agenda has not, pe has not been able to proceed as it was anticipated when we all started getting our independence over 50 plus years ago. Yeah. And that really is our weakness in not being able to drive the kind of growth that our economies need. Okay. Now, um, on the issue of how the downturn has affected us, in Ghana in particular, it really has affected us in respect of remittances. We have been in the lucky position of having discovered oil in commercial quantities a couple of years ago, and that has brought its own investment, and that has not changed with the global economic downturn. Our major commodities have not seen a fall in their prices either, cocoa and gold. And so to that extent, we haven't been as negatively affected as others. But we have a lot of our skilled workforce that is outside of Ghana, and that's where we have the challenge. Okay. Uh, Luis Viegas, if I could bring you in, can I just see you just peeping out from behind that? I mean, uh, you're uh, a lot, uh, literally a long way from Asia, so are you, are you do you join in this trend of being Asia-focused, or is Latin America is still looking mainly north to North America in terms of future investment, uh, foreign investment, and trade patterns? And, and also, how, how is Colombia doing? I mean, how, how, is, how has the recession hit you? What stage are you at? Yeah. Thank you, Gideon. Well, I think the reality is that, the current reality is that Latin America has still very strong ties economically with the United States. And that's going to remain a fact for a few years more. But when you take a look at the vote uh, this room just gave, uh, that's the thinking of, uh, of business people in Latin America. We are going to find uh, different sources of growth in the next decade than the US or Europe or Japan. Uh, those sources are going to come from a few countries in Asia Pacific, a few countries in Africa, and a few countries in South America. So 
we have to join those efforts and uh, have more trade, more investment uh, to multiply the effects of that new growth that will come. Uh, and then the, the interest of Latin America for uh, the Asia Pacific is growing dramatically. And mostly in the countries that, like Colombia, have a neighborhood in the Pacific region. So uh, instruments like APEC or P4 or P9 are uh, instruments that we are uh, very interested in using to attract investment and to increase uh, trade. Now to your second part. Um, Fortunately, Latin America is this time not blamed for being the source of the world crisis. This is the first time in 50 years we are not guilty of the world economic crisis. <laughs> and that's a big step forward. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, the advice for the crisis in Latin America and Russia was, first, you're going to have to increase your public deficit. Two, you cannot print money. Three, you cannot increase your debt. And four, you cannot bail out anyone. Yeah. Then you take uh, 10 years later the same recipe and look at the Washington looks consensus different, was not, uh, not followed in Washington. The most, the most flourishing manufacturing industry in the United States is printing money. <laughs> <laughs> the bailouts are even bigger every day. Uh, the uh, deficits are huge, and debt is going to have to be paid for the next generation at least. Latin America has applied a different remedy 10 years ago, and I think we, have, we can feel proud that we have been able to face the crisis in a better shape. So uh, just a quick question though, but are you saying you think the Americans should have followed their own advice, the advice they gave to, to Latin America? I think, that, I think that's something that will happen. What we'll have in front of us, uh, a decade of high risk of inflation, of high risk of higher interest rates, of high risk of unemployment that will not recover at the same pace we are used to in, uh, in other crises in the past. Uh, and then uh, that those are regions of the world. The developed northern world is going to be very important for, this, for the developing nations to be kept as markets and sources of investment. Okay. But the new growth is not going to come from there. Thank you very much. Now, now Mr. Lim, uh Malaysia was always regarded as something of a model for developing countries, as a, you know, a country that had been highly successful in developing e export industries. And I know that Penang in particular, uh, your area, is at the cutting edge of, of Malaysian export industries, but we've now had this huge global downturn in trade. How are you doing? Well, we, were, we were impacted uh, quite negatively. But I think that um, when we are uh, basically a, a a trade-driven economy, we had no choice but to adjust. But if I can just go back again to what Please, uh, yes. Luis mentioned just now, you, you must look at the source of this crisis. It was basically a financial crisis brought about by, I would say, irresponsible banks in the West, uh, where there were losses of uh, up to 4.1 trillion US dollars, recapitalization costs of 875 billion US dollars, causing, of course, a global recession that now we are still counting the cost of between 8 trillion to 33 trillion US dollars, depending on which World Bank or IMF economists you are talking to. Now, the point is, who started this crisis? It is not Asians, definitely not Latin Americans, definitely not Africans. But then the problem is, what I perceive is, we seem to be paying the price for it. Now, why are we paying the price for it? For example, the prescriptions given by World Bank, which I think Luis mentioned just now, which was not followed by the United States, that basically we have to have cutbacks in spending, we have to uh, uh, open up to, to investments, and when you talk about cutbacks in spendings, the, the very people you're hurting are, of course, the poor. And when, you, uh, when, when we have to open ourselves to investments, and with uh, diminishing uh, uh, funds available, uh, diminishing FDIs available, what you see is a spiraling race down to the bottom, where all these countries compete for foreign investments, for foreign investments by offering lower standards, cheaper resources, and of course, cheaper wage rates. And the one that loses out are always the ordinary people. Now in Penang, we try to avoid that. We try to avoid that by number one, we try to find an alternative engine of growth. 
And we are fortunate that we have at least tourism to help us along. And at the same time, we refuse to lower our standards because we believe that the road to the future is to maintain branding, standards and quality. And to do that, we try to find a prescription that can help our people to weather over the storm. Now, that doesn't mean that we reject everything that the West offers, no. What we want to find is, of course, to find a happy medium. Because I think the strong suit of the Western uh, prescriptions are essentially their transparency, their accountability, and their strong auditing procedures. And that's always been the weak point of uh, some Asian countries, because when you talk about stimulus packages, you're always talking about leakages. And leakages is a very big problem in many Asian countries. Mm. So if we can somehow marry the Western approach, the, the uh, desire or the emphasis on accountability, the emphasis on auditing requirements, and marry that with the Asian compassion that we must help the people so that they do not get hurt for something they are not responsible for. And that's what we tried to do in Penang. And well, thank God we managed to weather the storm. And so far, as I said, uh, unless there's a double dip again, hopefully there's not. Uh, I'm, I, as I said, the, uh, the worst effects uh, have gone past so far. And um, we are, of course, trying to switch from the present manufacturing base to the services sector. Okay. Well, thanks for that interesting thoughts on a kind of fusion of uh, the Western and, and Asian approaches. Now, Mr. Shah Zhu Kang, uh, you, you have to kind of view the world in the round, sitting, sitting in New York for the United Nations. H how do you feel these initial fears about the developing world being the, the, the part of the world that would be hit hardest by the economic crisis? Has that been borne out, and, and what can be done? Well, we have a saying in China that uh, the truth is sometimes uh, mastered by only a few. People say that uh, the future or the hope for the future lies in China. I think that may lie in the remote future. According to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations, China is still in the rank as a low middle income country. So I would say that it uh, is only possible in the very remote future for China to be able to lead the global economy. I think that US and uh, European countries in the very long term will still be the main driving forces behind the economic growth and development in the world. And uh, from the perspective of the United Nations, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs we feel that the world is faced with major or multiple challenges. One is the financial crisis, and the other crisis is related with the climate change. The financial crisis, as you described just now, is not caused by the poor countries. Of course, I don't need to point out who is responsible for the financial crisis, but it is the poor countries that suffer. And the crisis of uh, climate change is also caused by the industrialized uh, countries. It is uh, the emission of uh, the uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by those uh, rich countries over the past uh, hundreds of years. Still, the developing world is suffering from this uh, climate change crisis. So I think that there is some problem with the system, with the mechanism that we have. From the perspective of the United Nations, well, just take financial crisis as an example. We have a G8, we have a G20. The United Nations is also involved in the discussion. What we are really interested in is those who are suffering from the uh, uh, crisis or the poor and the most vulnerable. What well, the result of the financial crisis this time is very clear. Developed countries uh, will not become developing countries because of this financial crisis. However, developing countries will become poorer and uh, suffer more. While well, talking about the impact of the crisis, uh, well, well, economic growth dropped by a big margin, unemployment increased by a big margin. 
Now we have about 50 million people who lost a job. Uh, trade and trade dropped by a big margin, and the uh, price of uh, export goods also dropped. Um, also, uh, fi financing uh, cost is increasing. Well, these are the problems that developing countries are facing. Well, developing countries have nothing to do with the financial crisis, but they are the person who suffer the most. And uh, if they, well, those who follow developed countries closely are suffering even the uh, worst. So from the perspective of the United Nations, we care about uh, developing countries, developing world, because they don't have the uh, capabilities to take uh, anti-cycle uh, measures. They don't have the uh, methods to deal with the financial crisis. They need the help of the international arena. So developed countries had the um, obligations to um, help developing countries to have more off market access to increase rather than uh, decrease their uh, aid. Uh, they should also protect rather than uh, discriminate against immigration from a developing world. They should also help developing countries to guard against uh, risks because of uh, debt. Well, actually, the problems that we see from the financial crisis are very clear. Uh, less l lack of uh, regulation. So I think that uh, reform is uh, something that we must do. And also, uh, in particular, International Monetary uh, Fund has to reform itself. And uh, also, uh, it seems to me that uh, IMF is not that uh, democratic. Uh, one dollar, one vote. If you have more money, you have more s to say. So uh, those who are rich uh, has a um, has, has more say. Money is very important. It's not that uh, we, we shall not have more money, but I think the system of IMF requires to be reformed. So in a word, I have several uh, conclusions. Number one, well, the interdependence uh, is more and more obvious because of uh, globalization. Number two, We need to um, strengthen uh, regulation. In particular, uh, we need to um, reform the system of the financial system in the world. Very much indeed for that uh, provocative and, and uh, comprehensive overview. Uh, Mr. Zhang, it seems to me that um, there's a lot. You should both be uh, very flattered by how much uh, people expect from China and, and the role that they see China playing in the global economy. But also, the expectations are very high. Do you, do you agree that China is going to be the, the motor of the world economy? And, and how do you think you can help the developing world? What's, what's the best way? For you know, the Deputy Secretary of the United Nations mentioned, China is still a developing country right. with the per capita GDP only 3,000 US dollars. But anyway, China will do our best to help the developing countries, to help each other. This means that China will do our best in the, as the largest developing country to help the developing countries with the different ways. For example, under the South-South Cooperation Framework, China will offer continually the different kind of assistance to the developed countries at the form of the grant, the trade aid, technical assistance, and to encourage Chinese enterprises, investment in the developing countries. And of course, we pay great attention to cooperation with the African countries because it's really suffered a lot from this international financial crisis. So China will, of course, to implement the measures which we agreed with the African countries to uh, different ways. That's one thing I should emphasize. Secondly, I think that 
the developed country itself should take proactive and target measures to make intensive effort to boost our domestic demand and, of course, to give full play of competitive advantage in order to alleviate the negative impact of the economic recession, <coughs> which are uh, experience of China to dealing with the international financial crisis. And of course, China and other developing countries need to you know, strengthen the cooperation, both in terms of trade, technical, and the investment. And of course, we should also develop the cooperation between the developing world and developed world. And the third opinion, from my personal opinion, is that give the full play of the active role of the United Nations, the World Bank Group, and the IMF in solving the problems of development, reaching the United Nations Millennium Development Goal and the alleviation of the poverty, raise the more resources for developing countries, and the developed countries should significantly increase the official development aid, provide support to developing countries in the economic and the social development unconditionally. And one of the important topic is dealing with the climate change. Just like the Deputy Secretary Xia mentioned that in combating climate change, we must follow the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. That means we should not only deal with challenges around the climate change, but we should also provide enough development space to the developing countries. And I, for China itself, of course, because we have the largest number of population, one-fifth of the world, so the overall size of our economy is relatively large. In the last year, it's around four trillion US dollars, and this year, it's quite possible we can reach the original target, 8% increase, so from this point of view, China will play more and more important role to promote the world economic and social development. But still, just like I mentioned earlier, China is a low per capita income developing country. There's still a long way to go. Okay. Just uh, thank you for that very interesting presentation and listening to you. I just have one brief follow-up question. You said uh, that the, uh, you talked about the developing and the developed world. Where would you place China? I mean, is it, is it uh, do we regard it for terms, when we think of foreign aid, as a developed country that gives out aid, or as a developing country that, that receives it, or is it somewhere in between? You know, just like uh, I mentioned that, for China itself, we are still, in the position of a developed country. Mm. But because the reform and the opening, because of fast development, now we have some capability to provide aid to the developing countries. But in the international community, still I hope that the developed country should you know, play a more important role. Good, well we've got about uh, 20 minutes left. It's a, it's a short session with so much to, to say. But uh, I'd like to now take some questions from the audience. Could I ask people since, uh, to say who you are, uh, ask a question rather than making a statement, and if you wanted to direct it to a particular panelist, do say. There's a, a lady in the middle there with her hand up. I think a microphone should come your way. I hope so. There usually is a, a microphone. Do we have microphones? Uh, 
Well, you may have to shout at this rate. Uh, ah, here we come. I'm from a financial portal website, Heshin.com, and my question is to Mr. Zhang Xiaoqiang. I have a question to Mr. Zhang Xiaoqiang. As a developing country, we are always faced with the issue of uh, uh, overlapping uh, development. For example, in the new energy uh, area, actually, uh, this is also an issue that has been raised. You mentioned that you encourage foreign investors' investment to be involved in um, a new energy industry. And I want to know whether this will increase the overlapping or uh, duplicated construction in the new energy area. Your question, in fact, is not so, uh, you know, uh, directly related to no. the to you know, elevation answer, of we'll the developing on, country. No. It's mainly for China. I can only give you a very brief sure. response is that, uh, of course, China will develop the new industry, including the new energy industry, but they already have some small bubbles in some, you know, new industries like the, you know, solar power. Right. So we are trying to use the you know, more comprehensive policy framework to, uh, you know, cooling this uh, overheating of the sun bubble <laughs> at the early stage. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Um, right, in the, in, the, in the front row, the gentleman here. I'm from a China Business uh, Network. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Sha, or oh, is Chinese. Now, uh, there are several months before the uh, Copenhagen summit. European Union has just decided to provide uh, 15 billion uh, euro to uh, developing countries. However, uh, this is still far away from the requirements of uh, developing countries led by uh, India and some other countries. And uh, also, it seems that developing countries and developed countries still have a big gap uh, in uh, certain uh, areas regarding uh, climate changes. So uh, in the several months before we had the Copenhagen uh, summit, how can we deal with the uh, differences and to make sure that we uh, can try to reach an agreement at the Copenhagen summit? I think I, then I will deserve a Nobel Peace Prize. What if you can solve Copenhagen? Well, we'll, we'll fix it. <laughs> that was very influential. Well, <laughs> on the issue of climate change, I would say that uh, the developing world and the developed world have uh, contradictory positions. And uh, we do not see any hope of uh, breaking away with this stalemate between the two blocks. What does the issue lie? On the issue of uh, climate change, there are four pillars. First is adaptation. Second is mitigation. Third, financing. And fourthly, uh, technical transfer. The first and the second two questions are the end of uh, the solution. And the financing is uh, just a means to reach our end. Uh, Mr. Zhang Xiaoqiang also pointed out that point just now. According to the framework agreement, according to the Paris uh, roadmap, the source of the cause of uh, climate change is uh, mainly the industrialized uh, countries. So we have to stick to the principle of common and differentiated uh, responsibility. The developed countries and developing countries agree to this uh, agreement. However, uh, they agree to this uh, principle. However, sometimes uh, the developed countries do not uh, fulfill their obligation. The developing countries, as well as the developed 
countries have to shoulder our own responsibilities, but the developed countries should pay out more money and have to make more efforts, while the developing countries should also should also take some national appropriate uh, mitigation uh, actions. But uh, the uh, developed countries uh, should uh, take the lead. The, uh, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm conscious that although it's a okay, crucial question, okay, okay, it's okay. not totally uh, central to our discussion. I will finish just a minute. Please, yeah. Um, good. I, I, uh, so you, sorry, you want, you want to round off, please, please. I, uh, yes, I got a point. I think there is no choice, but the only, cho the, the only choice is the, for the developed, developed country to work together to, to find a common ground. I believe that there is a chance that they will be able to do it. For example, on, on issues like renewable energy, on issues like uh, energy efficiency, on issues like uh, reforestation. So, so that's why the Secretary General has already uh, proposed to convene a summit on the 22nd of September. I, according to information, over 100 heads of state and government are participating. I'm sure with those, the leaders together, if they could come up with a firm declaration commitment, that will certainly serve as a big push for the success of Copenhagen meeting. Okay, thank brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. Now, do we have uh, some questions more directly focused? Yeah, the lady just there in the middle. No, 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 no over there. Sorry. Yeah, that, that lady. Yeah. Yes, my question is directed sorry, to... Sorry, could you just say who you are as, as well? Yes, my name is Abdel Mahdi from Sudan. Uh, my, my question is directed to Mr. Mahedin and Ms. Hana Tata of Ghana. I'm recognizing the increasing in financial flows to, uh, from Asia to Africa, and specifically to Egypt and to Ghana and Sudan. And in, in recognition of this, and especially to also um, increasing financing for development projects, and Ms. Hanna's uh, comment on the kind of style, uh, the different style of the Chinese uh, in, in this regard, and the fact that they allow us to, uh, to, 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 to choose and pick our uh, our projects for financing. Uh, in this regard, and I would have liked to see a non-government player there, uh, the dilemma um, that this poses with regards to the fact, the, the decision for, uh, for choosing these projects. I mean, you as a government, you, you think that you are making the right choice, but a non-government player would, would not agree with you. So, uh, you, so this is a dilemma. You think that uh, the, the Western world or the international players, the World Bank and the IMF, are, are putting conditionalities that uh, you feel that you are past this, and I would definitely agree. And as a non-government player, I would agree fully with you that we have had enough of all these conditions. But at the same time, I have that I'm in a dilemma that uh, I do not agree that you as a government player are the best placed to make the right decisions on these development projects. Okay. So we are in this dilemma. My second question is the fact that the Chinese or the Asian uh, financial flows are non-concessional. So this is an issue that you have not discussed. So how do you consider this as regards to the uh, non-concessionality uh, at attached to, to the other financial flows? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so the two questions there for the two of you. One seems to come down to that the Chinese style of in aid and investment suits you as ministers, but is it necessarily best for society? And the second on the form of aid and concessionality, which I was... I, you know, I don't think that any government, any responsible, democratically elected government takes decisions on its own. Minister, could, we you, could take, you just speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Sorry. <laughs> I'm saying that I don't think any responsible, democratically elected government, and in Ghana, our governments are democratically elected governments, take decisions on their own. These are in consultation with civil society organizations as well in order to get something that has national buy-in. And we try as much as possible to do that because we are in a very demand-driven uh, profession. If you don't do what the people want, they vote you out. And so, you know, it's that basic. Regarding the issue of concessionality, yes, 
you would say that perhaps development aid comes with its concessions. But given the conditions precedent, actually when you cost those things, what really is the concession? And so if you factor it in as a business transaction from the start, and you know that this is what it is going to cost you, and you do the projects that are key to being able to expand your infrastructure base, to allow you to improve your own supply chains, and to help you to become a lot more competitive, then from our point of view, that's what we need to focus on to be able to get our economies growing and moving. And we don't see a contradiction in that. We think that it's important that we move away from thinking in terms of concessionality and handouts. Having said that, I recognize that this year, because we had a budget deficit, we had to go to the World Bank, we had to go to the IMF and do things that we otherwise would not have wanted to do. But we consider that to be a stopgap measure given our current circumstances this year. It's certainly not the prescription for the way forward. Minister? Right. Um, let me link as well my answer to um, what was raised earlier regarding the role of China from a developing country perspective, and very quickly. Here we are facing two kind of models. One of them is telling you, do what you want, um, make your own choices, select your own projects. I don't really care how did you reach the priority um, of that project, but when it comes to implementation, I'm going to be helpful. I'm going to be giving you concessional terms of funding. And here, you cannot really put China in answering your question to the Vice Chairman. Is it a developing country in this case or a developed country? It, ca it could be basically beyond standard classification because you can get what you want from a developed country from a kind of a developing country kind of warmth of relation. So this is basically what we can be seeing. And again, are we in this place? You can classify it as a place in a typical developing country. If this city, Dalian, is a place of a developing country, if this region that we're in is a standard developing country, or it's something else. I think let's put China in its big uh, perspective, not to exaggerate its role and function, as the right gentleman mentioned of the panelists, and not to rely on it fully, because at the end of the day, the issue of growth is a domestic issue. You cannot really expect the globe to be dependent once on the United States and in the other time on China. What is happening in the rest of the world is very crucial. And I think there is something that we have to learn, and in answering directly that question, is basically could be an advantage that at some stage there was a Washington consensus, which is almost dead, but there is no Beijing consensus. You can do whatever you, know, you need. You can do whatever you, you want. You select your own priorities. In doing so as well, there is a great deal of learning from developing countries, including my own country, from the Chinese example and from the rest of that neighborhood in terms of the dependence on markets, in terms of integration fully with the rest of the world, getting FDI and exports, in terms of relying on markets to, re to reallocate resources, in terms of investment in human capital and, for God's sake, savings, saving that is very much missing from the developed world, almost when they are, some of the countries only have 1% to 2% of GDP of savings, if they do save, and the typical developing countries of around 12 uh, to 14%, which is too low. And finally, it's to have this kind of cred credible, committed um, uh, program that has been implemented without any kind of a stop on any kind of uh, disruption. This is the case of Malaysia, this is the case of Singapore, and in China. And very soon, China is celebrating 60th birthday of, of the Republic, and you are seeing that after 30 years of reform, they are achieving things that every typical person in any developing country would like to see, at least in the achievements of these kind of standard of livings and achievements in development. So maybe if there, there isn't a Beijing consensus, there's a Beijing model, something that you can aspire to, to emulate. Uh, yeah, but it's very much a, a, a pragmatic one without any conditions attached to it, thus being in your, your own, in your own development. If it is a consensus, well, we would accept it. Okay. We've probably got room for, for one, one more question. Uh, I look at, I'm always conscious you're a bit biased towards the front, so I'll go right to the, to the back. There's a woman just there. You're right by the microphone. Uh, 
the lady just there. Ni hao. Sorry. Uh, oh. Actually, I was just trying to. Well, why don't you both ask a question? We'll see what happens. But uh, <laughs> can, can you keep it short, though? Ah, ni hao, ni hao. Hey, I'm from Weibo. I'm from Weibo. I'm from Weibo. I'm from from Weibo. I'm from Weibo. The developed countries have paid a very high cost environmentally in together with economic growth. So what's your view on the relationship between economic growth and environmental cost? Next year, that's the last question. I, I just, uh, my name is Tish Durkin, I'm from The Week, and I wanted to see if anyone, any or all of the panel have any uh, perspective on what, from a policy point of view, the United States and the West can do, if anything, to rescue itself from this fate of looming irrelevance that seems to be viewed as inevitable in this room? I mean, is there anything that we can or should be doing? Okay, well, look, I will uh, take the initiative of, if everybody answers that, we'll have another hour. So I'll just, uh, <laughs> I'll just ask Mr. Villegas, as the per person closest to the United States, who would seem to give us a bit of an advice on what the US should be doing. And then uh, there was, I don't know who'd like to take the question about the environmental consequences, but uh, Mr. Villegas first on, on the US. Well, I think uh, all developed nations look alike. And every single underdeveloped nation has a single reason to be underdeveloped. So what we should do with the United States and Latin America is to try to make the right decisions together with the United States. It gives a lot of hope that the Obama administration has given a new view uh, over Latin America. But let's hope that the gap between words and actions uh, becomes really uh, closer. We in Colombia, we have a pending agenda with the United States that we hope will be solved with the Obama administration fast. We have an FTA to be ratified by the Congress. We have uh, higher cooperation against drug trafficking and terrorism. We have a huge investment agenda in energy and water and environment. So let's hope that uh, this health issue in the Congress permits the Obama administration to take a, a better look to Latin America. And of course, Colombia will be in the first place of that list. OK. Um, I, I mean, the environment is such a global issue that, uh, yes, maybe, maybe Mr. Shah, as, as somebody you know, you have to take a global view. Talk about the environment and the crisis. Yeah. I think those two are not contradictory. Uh, you must develop first. Without development, you cannot do anything. You cannot even address the issue of environment. But at the same time, when you develop, you must take full into account the necessity of the protection of the environment. Thirdly, you may think that those are contradictory. No. Now, with the advancement of tech, with the science and technology, with the, I think, the ICT in the development, we are now in the position to, to get the best of the both worlds. That is to say, to develop without the sacrifice of the environment, such like green growth, we can, like clean energy. So there are many ways to develop the economy while at the same time protect the environment. I think the whole world is working along that direction. Okay, well, look, thank, thank you very much for ending on a, a relatively optimistic note after a discussion that could have been a little bit gloomy. Um, it's been fascinating to hear, as I say, viewpoints from really all around the world uh, in this discussion. It's a hard discussion to summarize because uh, everybody is, 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 has their own concerns, but I think that the general picture is that things aren't as bleak as they looked nine months ago, but also that there's been a sort of shift in perception because of this crisis that... I think that the prestige of the, the United States and it, the, the sense that it really is the core of the global economy, certainly at the moment, that's taken a bash and there's a huge interest both in China for practical reasons as an investor uh, and as a source of aid, but also in a Chinese way of doing things. Uh, and that perhaps makes it all the more appropriate that we're here in Dalian. So I'd uh, like to thank the forum for organizing this and thank you all for taking part in this very interesting session. Thank you.